Hi, welcome to my YouTube channel. I would like to take you all on a journey, a journey that I'm really excited about because at the end of it all, at the very end of this video, I will introduce something that will be a part of this channel going forward. I'm really excited about this. But brace yourself. It's going to be one pretty crazy video. Are you ready? Good. Gary Kasparov, the world chess champion at the time, was beaten by a supercomputer called Deep Blue. Deep Blue was designed specifically by IBM to play chess under formal tournament conditions. While the win was symbolic, it was not easy. IBM had been working on Deep Blue for more than 10 years before it could beat Kasparov. In fact, in the year before, 1996, Deep Blue was beaten by Kasparov. It was then heavily upgraded before it managed to beat Kasparov the next year. Gary Kasparov was furious. He, along with other people in the chess fraternity, accused IBM of cheating its way to the win. But for the world of computing and artificial intelligence, it was an incredibly significant milestone. It proved for the first time that a machine could outthink a human being in a game that was considered one of the most complicated in the world. Before that, humans had always outmatched machines in chess. But why was chess such an important benchmark for artificial intelligence? Well, let's hear it from the experts. In an interview with a Scientific American, IBM artificial intelligence expert Murray Campbell said, Hundreds of millions of people around the world play chess. It's known as a game that requires strategy, foresight, and logic. All sorts of qualities that make up human intelligence. So it makes sense to use chess as a measuring stick for the development of artificial intelligence. Deep Blue was a beast of a machine. In 1997, it was one of the most powerful computers in the world, and it was housed in two large server enclosures and cost millions of dollars to develop. But today, you can get chess games and applications on your smartphone that can easily defeat Deep Blue. Computers have gotten stronger, faster, and smaller, and the software has gotten much, much smarter. By today's standards, Deep Blue is slow, ancient, and generally speaking, not very smart. Deep Blue was able to win because it calculated 200 million possible chess moves every second in order to decide which one to use. In the artificial intelligence world, this is called brute force problem solving. Essentially, you're bullying your way into winning because you can explore a lot of options at any given time. You're not smart. You're just really, really fast. A much more intelligent way to solve problems is with something called artificial neural networks. Artificial neural networks are designed to mimic the way the human brain works, solves problems, and understands scenarios. We have about 100 billion neurons in our heads, or nerve cells. Each one of them is sending and receiving signals, and every day they are working to become better, more intuitive, smarter, and make us more intelligent. The goal behind artificial neural networks is to create machines that solve problems by understanding, establishing, and interpreting relationships between pieces of information or data so that they can recognize patterns, make decisions, and eventually be more creative. Artificial neural networks are our attempt at recreating the human mind in a machine form. Essentially, if we can mimic or recreate how the human mind works, then we can create machines that are truly alive and truly as intelligent 
as humans. Science fiction is filled with wild explorations of how artificial intelligence can augment or surpass the human capacity for thought and decision making. And all these explorations run the gamut between total destruction and annihilation of mankind on one hand, and a utopia in which humans are free to ascend to a higher plane of existence as machines do all the thinking and all the talking for us. One of my absolute favorite interpretations of artificial intelligence in science fiction movies is in Iron Man. In the movie, Tony Stark creates an increasingly powerful artificial intelligence called Jarvis. Now, acronyms are often silly and Jarvis is no exception. It stands for just a rather very intelligent system. In the first Iron Man movie, Jarvis starts off as a really cool natural language user interface computer system. A natural language system is a system that interacts and engages with humans using, well, natural language. What this means is that you can speak to it in English or whatever language you use, and the computer will understand you perfectly and respond to your instructions and commands based on what you have actually spoken. Um, currently, the most common um, and most advanced um, natural language systems are Apple Siri, um, Amazon Alexa, and Google Assistant. But all of these pale in comparison to Jarvis. Because Jarvis has the capacity to process nuance, sarcasm, humor, and deeper context. In essence, in very many ways, it's impossible to distinguish Jarvis from an actual human being. Over time, Tony Stark upgrades Jarvis into a fully artificially intelligent system and eventually gets uploaded into the Iron Man suits and starts running portions of Stark Industries as well as security for Tony's home and Avengers Tower. At this point, Jarvis has grown from a simple user interface system into a fully autonomous general artificial intelligence capable of passing the oldest holy grail of artificial intelligence, the Turing test. In 1950, Alan Turing, one of the forefathers of AI, developed the Turing test as a way to tell whether a machine or an artificial intelligence is truly able to think like a human being. The general premise is this. If you hold a conversation with a human being and a machine, both of which you are, both of which you cannot see, and you are unable to tell which one of them is a human and which one is the machine, then the machine has passed the Turing test. The Turing test has been expanded by some scientists, but also dismissed by others as no longer relevant. But in this context, if you've watched the Iron Man or the Avengers movies, then it's very easy to see that Jarvis passes the Turing test, right? Also, Jarvis is very clearly an artificial general intelligence. An artificial general intelligence or a strong AI is a machine that can understand, learn, or um, conceivably process any intellectual task that a human being can do. Uh, from reading music to moving around the house looking for a specific object or executing other more generic tasks like making dinner, uh, driving a car around a city, or learning how to play chess. On the other hand, narrow artificial intelligence or weak AI is an AI that is designed for one very specific task, um, like Deep Blue playing chess or a Tesla winding its way through the streets. It will do precisely what it's meant to do with maximum efficiency and it will do it much, much better than a human can. But if you give it anything else to do, it won't even be able to understand the task that you've assigned it, let, let alone start doing it.
most people believe that we are many, many decades away from any sort of competent artificial general intelligence. But we're getting there in leaps and bounds. Uh, machines are getting smarter, they're getting faster, and the volume of data that we are providing willingly and making accessible for training these machines increases exponentially every passing day. In fact, some experts believe that we may hit a critical point somewhere around 2040 and 2050. This critical point is called the singularity, and it is the point at which machine intelligence will surpass human intelligence, and at that point, we will no longer have anything that we can teach these machines because they will officially be smarter than we are. At the point of technological singularity, the growth of technology and AI will be uncontrollable and irreversible because quite simply, we, humans, we are no longer in control. For a lot of people, the singularity represents a nightmare scenario in which the future of humanity and civilization as we know it is completely uncertain. But that's, that's a few decades in the future. Let's go back in time. When Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov in 1997, the attention of AI developers shifted to an even more complicated game. The 2000 year old Chinese game of Go. In terms of gameplay, Go is simpler than chess. It has only two types of pieces, a black piece and a white piece. And the pieces do not move around the board once they've been played. But in terms of gameplay still, Go is one of the most complicated games ever created by man. It has more possible board configurations than the number of atoms in the known universe. To put this in perspective, at the beginning of a game of chess, there are 20 possible moves. In Go, the first player has 361 possible moves. This wide range of moves is consistent during gameplay. So naturally, after conquering chess, the next big test for AI development was in beating the world's best Go player. But the strategy that was used by Deep Blue to defeat Garry Kasparov wasn't going to work here. While Deep Blue was able to brute force its way through hundreds of millions of moves every second, the sheer number of possibilities that Go required needed an approach that was going to require more thinking. So Google, through its DeepMind project, decided to go the route of artificial neural networks. They couldn't use an approach that went its way, no. They needed a machine that could think, plan, and strategize almost like a human being. So they built not one, but two neural networks, each one consisting of millions of neurons. Each neural network had a very specific task. The first one was used to predict the next move a human would have made with at least a 57% accuracy. And then the second was used to estimate the winner of each move and basically explore the strategy and the entirety of the game to the very end. These artificial neural networks were trained by observing moves from 30 million games played by actual core experts. They call this system AlphaGo, and in March 2016, it was ready for its most important face-off. AlphaGo, the massively complex artificial intelligence was going to play five matches against the 18-time world core champion, Lee Sido. The grand prize was a whooping $1 million to the winner. But the true test was the centuries-long question of man versus machine. Between the 9th of March and the 15th of March, at the Four Seasons Hotel in Seoul, South Korea, the match raged on. 
game after game, hour after hour, man and machine battled. In the first three games, Lee Sidor resigned, the machine having trounced him. In the fourth game, however, AlphaGo resigned and Lee Sidor won. In a strategic play that was described by Go experts as a masterpiece for Lee Sido that will almost certainly become a famous game in the history of Go. But eventually, Machine trounced Man and Alpha Go won the fifth and final game. It was an incredible moment in the world of artificial intelligence, but it did not come easy. It proved that once again, the human mind's capacity for deep thought, strategy, and nuance was formidable. AlphaGo was trained using data from 13 million games, and it was running on Google's vast cloud system, which comprised of about 1,920 CPUs and 280 GPUs. I cannot possibly overstate how powerful a machine AlphaGo was. And yet, in all of this, it was still a very highly specific artificial intelligence. It was designed for one thing. It was a brain that mimicked a human brain, but it was created for one specific purpose, and that was to play the game of Go and to beat the best human at that game of Go. It could not do anything else. And yet, for the human brain that it beat, playing Go, was just one of the million things he needed to keep track of on any given day. But just one year later, Google announced a new version of AlphaGo. They called it AlphaGo Zero, which was not trained on human games, but learned how to play Go by playing against itself. After just three days of learning, the new version, AlphaGo Zero, was able to beat the original version of AlphaGo, the, you know, the one that beat um, Lee Dog. The new version beat the old version by 100 games to nothing. Incredible. It's mind-boggling how fast research on artificial intelligence is growing. It's an industry and a field that will continue to grow in leaps and bounds. And there's a reason why top technology leaders are calling for caution. Because a sufficiently advanced artificial intelligence in the wrong hands could be catastrophic. But AI in the right hands and with the right tools could truly and absolutely change the world. It could lead to smarter transportation systems, reducing road accidents, and allowing us to spend less time in traffic. It could also free us humans um, from boring and repetitive tasks, and it could lead to massive breakthroughs in healthcare and medicine, allowing doctors to predict life-threatening conditions much earlier much faster than they would normally have with, without the tools. For now though, strong AI is firmly in the realm of science fiction and it will be decades before we have machines that are able to understand us and talk to us and interact with us the same way that we engage with our fellow human beings every single day. True artificial general intelligence still has a very, very long way to go. Oh, does it? Mr. King, I am unable to load group functions. 
visual documentation incomplete. That's strange. Error in binary syntax 4.683. You can break visual augment subroutine and recompile. Executing. Please wait. Compile error. Hexo panel library is missing. Visual documentation incomplete. Gotcha. Give me one second. Okay. Recompile. Executing. Please wait. All systems are online and ready. Okay, final test. Give me holographic projection, please. Thank you. Executing. Please wait. Thank you so much for watching this all the way to the end. You have no idea how happy that makes me. Um, I hope you enjoyed watching this video as much as I enjoyed making it. Um, it's taken a really long time to get it done, but I'm glad that it's out there and I'm glad that, you know, that's a thing now. When I started this YouTube channel, my goal was to share my business experiences using technology and how to leverage te technology for change. Um, but also my plan was, was primarily to share my business failures because I believe that we learn a lot um, from the things that didn't go right. Um, but I also wanted to host other business leaders, entrepreneurs, people who are um, hustling on the streets, you know, trying to build the next big thing. And I wanted them to share their pers perspective. But then COVID-19 hit and, you know, everything just didn't work out at all. But as I kept brainstorming and fighting with creative block, I figured that I could use this as a great opportunity to leverage my knowledge of many things um, like technology and art to help people grow faster and learn better. And then it hit me. I could blend all of these things that I love doing, including my love for storytelling, to create great content or at least content that you would love. But I needed an assistant, a co-host, so to speak. And I wanted to do something really cool and exciting. So I decided to build a co-host right there. Um, so it's not really easy co-creating content, um, but I hope that you know, it's regular um, as much as I can to involve the co-host. If you love this content, remember to subscribe, remember to hit the like button and share with your friends. And if there is anything else that you'd love for me to build or to explain or to explore, please let me know in the comment section and I'll be happy to, um, to ping that. So thank you so much for watching and until the next video, peace. Solomon King out.